Greetings, troubled a return to Haven listeners. This is your host with the most, though I hate to boast, Rich French. And what you are accessing now is a small segment from our companion series, Troubled with Extra Syrup, which you can listen to on our second tier level on Patreon. Enjoy. Take a seat at the Grey Goal and get the pancakes ready because Trouble with Extra Syrup is here to fill that craving for more Haven-related content. Welcome to our patron-exclusive series of episodes, Trouble with Extra Syrup. There's the title twice, and that's how good it is. We have a couple tiers, as you just as you know, if you're listening to this, you've subscribed to the $3 tier or higher, which means you're getting this. You're going to get a fan shout-out if you haven't already, your Wu-Tang nickname, uh, access to director cut episodes as they roll out. And, uh, you know, an option to try to set up a Q&A with us or a, a, a live t- a, a chat. Yeah. Hey, if they if they want to get, you know, I'll warn them. They might not want to see our ugly mugs, but uh, if they want to, <laughs> they can. Right. These episodes drop once a month. Uh, the past couple ones we've done is stuff like col- covering the Colorado kid, talking about the uh, licensed music for season one of Haven. Uh, talking about Joyland and pitching our own versions of the TV show because there's just so much to talk about. We want to make sure that we cover material that may be outside of the general show. Uh, So this episode, we're talking about the Hulu exclusive series, Castle Rock. We haven't really done another TV show yet. We talked about some books, you know, and uh, this time we're kind of, we watched the whole of season one and we're going to talk about it since it's a Stephen King not only Stephen King related or series, it's not based off any particular book, but it's set in a shared universe of many Stephen King things. Uh, and Haven does something similar, so we wanted to talk. We thought it would. We thought it was fitting. Thought it would match the kind of profile of what we do. Oh, I agree completely. Y'all know who this is, but just in case, this is Rich French, the co-host. Oh, that's gonna have... be like the masked singer. It's gonna be like the masked yeah. podcasters. They're gonna that's have to nice. guess who this is. <laughs> I'm the French who is going to try to binge watch everything on Hulu before my free uh, subscription is over my trial. How much longer do you have the rest of December? Oh, it's okay. a pretty generous one. It's a 30 day free trial. Um, well, my name is Alex French. I'm your other host. Uh, not going to binge everything on Hulu. God Hulu. So, <laughs> all right. Well, so let's talk a bit about Castle Rock. It's 10 episodes. As I mentioned before, it's a Hulu exclusive uh, executive producer, J.J. Abrams does it. So, you know, it's got some money and some weight behind it. But the kind of guys credited are Sam Shaw and Dustin Thomason, I suppose, is how you. Uh, He's, you know, done other. So I know for Dustin Thomason, he's done other shows like The Evidence for ABC. And he is heading with uh, J.J. Abrams uh, as an executive producer and co-creator of HBO Max Bad Robots uh, Overlook show, which is set in the same universe as Stephen King. Oh, The Shining. Stephen King's The Shining, not same universe as Stephen King. That'd be this universe. <laughs> not to be confused with Willie from The Simpsons and The Shining. So there's some kind of there's clearly some King love there. And even in this, I don't think they're connected, but we get some Shining. Uh, uh, we have some Shining references here, but we'll get to that. We'll get to our kind of King references segment. But real quick, just let's give a overview of the show. Not like uh, we're not going to in our normal series we go through the episode and kind of tell you what happened to keep you up to date this time we're just going to kind of give you the the kind of summary this to summarize generally what happens right 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 i mean it, it really starts with uh you know a retiring warden uh dale lacy uh kills himself he uh freaking uh ties a rope around his neck ties a rope to a tree and then drives off the edge of a cliff you know, plunging to his death while his head is violently snapped off his head. And it turns out he was the warden of Shawshank and he had closed the wing of Shawshank and he hid a kid. When when we say kid, we mean young adult. He's not like a child. Mm-hmm. He hid a kid in a cage at the bottom of a, you know, kind of a, a an tunnel. Abandoned, an abandoned wing. Wing. So, and eventually one of the guards feels bad about that when they find the kid and they call. And the only thing the kid will say is Henry Henry Matthew Deaver. Yeah. And uh, so 
a guilty guard calls Henry Deaver and Henry Deaver, who's a death row attorney, comes back home to Castle Rock to find out what's going on in Shawshank with this uh, kid and also to see his mother. Right. His mom is now shacked up with the former sheriff. Henry went missing for 11 days back uh, in 1991. His dad was at the bottom of a cliff dying when uh, they were found during the missing time period. And then the dad died at home later. Uh, Henry's neighbor also is in, is kind of like a main character. She is kind of an empath kind of. She can feel people's emotions, which has fucked up her life. Yeah, Molly Strand. She had a deep connection with uh, Henry because he was louder than everyone else. So she was really, you know, he really impacted her her life. Right. And there's there's a lot more characters. Uh, dark, dark things happen in the in the count, Castle County or was it Castle County or Castle Rock County, whatever. Uh, in the town of Castle Rock, things get are pretty dark as most of the citizens, the men almost all work at the prison. And it's just kind of a hopeless, joyless, uh, dying shithole, essentially. Right. And, you know, Molly Strand's trying to revitalize it by, you know, she wants to remodel this old building downtown and turn it into retail and all of that. She's got big dreams, but got big Castle problems. Rock. <laughs> She's got big problems like an opioid addiction, <laughs> which gets progressively gets worse as time goes by. Yeah. And Henry's mom is dealing with Alzheimer's. She's, you know, losing her shit. It's hard to kind of keep track of what's going on with her. Right. And uh, her, we, we can say it, her boyfriend, uh, Alan. Uh, Pangborn. Pangborn, the, the retired sheriff, you know, lives with her and, tr- and tries to help her. And Henry's kind of like, eh, I don't know if I'm cool with this, you know, type of thing. Yeah. He's also like, he also, the dad, the dying dad before he died that night, uh, talked to or wrote to the sheriff that his son did it or that Henry did it. Uh, so the sheriff has always kind of been sus- suspicious of Henry and that's why they're kind of have a adversarial uh, relationship. Yeah. There, there's, there's mis there's mistrust between them, but then as the story goes along, uh, Henry's trying to, you know, represent this, uh, this kid in the, uh, and I love the, the nickname, the inmates, because he was kept in a cage. The inmates started calling him Nick cage. Yeah. That's pretty funny. <laughs> Yeah, uh, get in the cage. Yeah, that'd be awesome. But nonetheless, so he's trying to represent him, the warden. Of course, it's a private corporation, so they're trying to play hardball. But eventually, the guilty guard ends up having to, uh, you know, con- reaching out to him, and you know, he they eventually relent and let him represent him. Right. So from there, you know, the through a bunch of there's a lot of stuff. But we're gonna just kind of breeze through it really fast. He gets out, like Henry gets the kid out. Um, once again, he is called the kid for, for the whole show. You don't know his name. He gets the kid out and shit goes, starts going around wrong around town. Henry finds out that him and his dad might have uh, been hearing the voice of God possibly. Yeah. Uh, his father, uh, his father, pastor, uh, Matthew, uh, was, uh, apparently thought when he went out to the woods, he could hear the, hear the voice of God and, uh, wanted Henry to as well. That's what they were doing out there that time when he went over to cliff and Henry went missing for, uh, 11 days, I believe it was. Right. And the kid is basically this just fucking evil malevolent force that anytime he's around people start hurting each other, killing people, things go crazy. Henry's trying to get control of it. His son has showed up in town. That's made the situation even worse. And uh, essentially, the kid tries to convince uh, Molly that he is Henry Deaver from an alternate universe who got stuck here by accident uh, when the, the shit went down in 1991 with Henry and his dad in the forest. Right. And it turns out, uh, at least according to the kid, he was the one who released Henry from the cage in the basement. Right. Cause in, he's, in, yeah. in his reality. And then he ends up following the kid, you know, following young Henry into the woods and gets, you know, through the doorway into the main timeline or our timeline where Lacey catches him, thinks he's the devil, throws him in the pit. The kid's right. In the pit. And so at the end, Henry and the kid are in the forest and the kid's trying to take Henry to the forest to open a doorway to back to his world. Or so he says, uh, Henry knows that something's fucked up. They get in a scuffle and the kind of the conclusion is uh, at one point when he gets knocked to the ground, we see the kid's real face and he's some monstrous demon or some shit. 
And then afterwards, or that's, or that's how Henry sees him. That's interesting. Uh, and at the end, Henry locks up the kid back in the abandoned abandoned wing of well of the whole now abandoned Shawshank Penitentiary. Uh, his mother has passed away, and things kind of just you know. Yeah, so he ends up on limping. Yeah, so he lives in Castle Rock now in the Deaver family home. And uh, Wendell, I don't think, I don't know if Wendell lives with him or just was visiting at, at the yeah, end. I think of the, Wendell, his son, is just visiting him. Visiting, yeah, probably his mom's in Boston. So, and that's what it, it basically ends up as a big repeat. Right. He Lace- takes over the warden's kind of position of guarding the kid. Right. All right. What did you think of uh, season one? So my main takeaway was uh, I really liked the season from the start. And I admit they totally surprised me with uh, the main center of the story. Uh, you know, at the beginning, I was totally thinking they took their inspiration from the Twilight Zone. And this was the Castle Rock version of the Howling Man. That's what I was going to bring up. I was like, I know you love the Howling Man episode of Twilight Zone. That is my favorite Twilight Zone episode of all freaking time. I absolutely love it. But, uh, but, you know, they got me. And at the end, you know, towards, towards the end, I think, I can't remember when, when I figured it out, I might've figured, started like piecing it together in, uh, no, I don't think it was till nine, actually. And I don't think when so. When you figured out what? The, that the kid was Hen- Henry Deaver in another timeline. Do you believe that? Did you I believe do. the story? I did. I don't, I don't believe him. I do. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I think he's lying. I think there's something else going on there. There, there, there might be, there might be, but it sure sounds, uh, I mean, okay. Okay. We'll continue, continue what you're saying, but we'll come okay, back. To okay. This. We'll come, we'll come back to that. Sure. The the parallel universe didn't really occur to me till pretty late. Like I was saying till, uh, you know, episode nine and you, and, uh, you're, these are Patreon listeners. They know I'm a fan of parallel universes. Yeah. My Joyland uh, concept that I came up with and always have been. Yeah, we, we won't say I had like sliders in the past, but uh, we, <laughs> well, we were considering doing a sliders podcast for like 10 seconds before we saw someone else had already done a, an extensive one. And then we <laughs> we also agreed that if we recorded it, we wouldn't actually even listen to it <laughs> ourselves. So we, had then we realized we'd have to watch the whole show and we're like, oh, fuck. No, never mind. No. So yeah, uh, yeah it had a lot of similarities to your pitch. Uh for Joyland, which I, once I got to episode nine and you're watching that uh, to everyone listening, episode nine is all about uh, the kid's version of events, basically where you're seeing his world and how he got to, to our, to the main world that we're witnessing. So uh, like episode nine is dedicated purely to that. So that's what we're talking about. Yeah. And I'll continue on that and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss more our, our differing takes on parallel universe, uh, the kid and uh so for me if the season ended at episode nine although that would be a shitty resolution it probably would have been a nine on the French meter you know but the end of episode 10 really brought it down for me i mm. hate the ending and uh <laughs> the end i hate the ending so much that it took it down to a seven because you know i still enjoyed the ride and was and i ain't gonna lie i was truly creeped out by some of the episodes especially watching them late at night i mean like I, the bandaged priest ghost he he was creepy. He was creepy. <laughs> yeah, that was a good and, visual. Uh, I think that was the yeah. like, was that episode two or three that that was kind of the big like the big cliffhanger moment where you see you're in Molly's Mid- house and you see him standing there for the first time. You're like, what the fuck? Yeah, he, he <laughs> that is creepy. I mean, in church with the congregants all re- with their faces wrapped up like mm-hmm. the priests. So that's what you know. Like I said, I really enjoyed the ride. I, I was genuinely creeped out and disturbed by some of the visuals, and I'll admit I probably didn't sleep as well after a couple of the episodes, which tells me that's a good you know that's a pretty damn good show. But like I said, my hatred of the ending gives maybe drop it down two points. I'll give it a conditional eight because there's a season two, um, which I know I know it's generally about different things, but like I know season two is kind of more. Uh, the main fuel in the tank of season two is like misery, you know, is like tied more to like the book slash movie misery than uh, I'm not sure what Castle Rock necessarily. I guess Shawshank, even though it's not really remotely like Shawshank Redemption at all. But I guess that's <laughs> kind of the central piece, like the central kind of, I don't know, or at least for the first half, it seems like most events are kind of tied to Shawshank Redemption. Or I'm sorry, Shawshank, not, not the movie. And so I think season two, it's like the events of misery are more like the main thing. But I know some threads are followed through in season two. So 
but right now I'll get a conditional eight. I, I like the endings. I like everything. It's hard because we just don't know what's up with the kid. And if we don't get answers in season two, then I'm going to be pissed. Um, and I have a suspicion that we're never going to find out really much. But um, I think I, I'm not sure if that's what your problem is. With uh, the end. Is it like lack of resolution? Yeah, there, there, you know, there's more to it. And I'll get into that more in, in a little bit. I just kind of wanted to let you finish your rating. But what I'm going to agree with you on is if I watch season two, and there isn't more resolution for the kid, I, I will be pissed. And I might even lower that seven. Nah, I can't lower the seven because I did enjoy the ride. So <laughs> nah, it'll, yeah. it'll stay at a seven, but I want, I want some resolution in season two. I mean, it's pretty typical of like a J.J. Abrams show too to tease you with a lot of, um, it was funny. There was a lot of J.J. Abrams stuff as was talked about actually in the Haven, when we were talking about the Haven pilot, how I was saying J.J. Abrams inspired some decision, a, a decision, I should even say, a decision they made. And in the season finale kind of coverage we did for uh, season one of Haven, I talked about how at the time a big, a post lost world of TV was about building up giant mysteries and not really answering them. And so you kind of see JJ Abrams fingerprints on this one too, with uh, not answering yeah. a lot of questions and being like uh, us enjoying the experience and the characters enough to, to let it slide. Another show of his that was interesting that to see some similarities to was, was fringe right because in fringe alternate fringe, realities yep. play a huge part and he's an executive producer on fringe i'm not sure how much involvement he had by that point in the show but it comes up again in this one so clearly in lost there's not alternate realities it's just timeline fuckery is like <laughs> is that is that the technical it. term timeline fuckery <laughs> yeah that's that's the jargon so yeah, i would give it an eight conditional i might at the end of season two, I might drop it to a seven or raise it to a nine, depending on the answers. Because I do like how the season ended. It's just not figuring out what the fuck the kid is, is annoying. But I love the way it ended with Henry basically taking on the duty of the warden. I like the way things were with Molly, because I don't like, like, what was cool about it was she's kind of just in the place. She's basically no better off or no better or no worse off. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, it's kind of the story of Castle Rock that all this horrible shit happens and you kind of just keep limping on, th you know, until the end. You know, you just keep going, even though your life's totally fucked and trashed and this world sucks. But but Molly, at least, is out of the shit now and at the end. You know, she's in Florida by her grandma and that's true you know, and starts a real estate business down there. So and that was the whole thing. Uh, Henry told her. You know, take Wendell to Boston, <laughs> drop him off by his mom's, and then you just keep fucking driving, you know, and make a life somewhere away from me and all this fucking chaos and in Castle Rock. So so I think, you know, but the problem was, I think Molly would be the person who would be advocating for uh, Henry to get the kid back to his world. She believed the kid for sure. If you you, you agree. Yeah, uh, I mean, she believed him, but I think she also was willing to trust whatever decision Henry made on the subject. Yeah, she clearly trusts Henry because she goes ahead and lets him know that the kid is at Harmony Hill where Henry rats him out and then the cops come and arrest him, throw him on the ground, cuff him. And as he's looking, he's looking at the headstone for Deaver Boy who, who died before the parents. So, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The just another little piece of evidence that, you know, in that universe – uh, that Henry Deaver didn't die, so they never adopted the other Henry Deaver. Of course. So how do you how do you know he's not okay? So here's like my counter theories. How do you know he's not some weird creature that is the aborted dead baby Henry that uh, and this alternate universe is a concoction uh, of him? It could be. I mean, it could it could be. That's kind of where where I'm leaning is that like he's the that's I was leaning that way once I heard <laughs> or once I heard about the dead son. Like that they had it that uh, Henry Deaver's parents, because Henry Deaver, I don't know if we said this in the summary, Henry's adopted. He's black. His parents are white. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty stark contrast. Once, uh, you, uh, once you see them, you'll know he's adopted. Once I found out about the Henry's parents trying to adopt a parent, trying to have a kid before they died, I was like, well, maybe like this kid could be it like or something. The kid could be the dead son or something like come back. Yeah, no, I, I, I get I get what you're saying. But the reason why I think it's 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 true is because Molly's an empath, right? Uh -huh. And she starts reliving his memories. Right, but what if it's something he feels so strongly and passionately about that it feels real? This is what the lie, this is what he 
you know, had to tell himself to keep him sane as he lived in a cage for 27 years. Yeah, or he's he, also, he could be like the devil or a demon, you know, like he could trick her. It still, it still could be a Howling Man episode. It could. All right. Thank you for listening to that limited sample of our sister series, Troubled with Extra Syrup. Once again, it's on Patreon. If you want to hear the rest of that episode, you can head over there. Uh, join us for $3 a month. It's uh, the middle tier. $5 if you want director's cuts, but that's where the rest of those episodes will be if you want to hear the rest of all of these awesome extra episodes. Thank you for listening. Check you out next time. No, fuck. Check you out next time. Check you out. Hey. I don't know where that came from. How you, how you doing? <laughs> Well, you'll be listening to us hopefully in a week. Please keep listening to us. <laughs> <laughs>